Uh, this morning, the GOP unveils its Pledge to America, a campaign manifesto to take back the House. Joining us now first on CNBC uh, with more on the plan, Congressman Peter Roscoe, uh, Vice Chairman of uh, America. Well, good morning, Congressman. You did this with one of the young guns, too, who we don't really know here on Squawk. Uh, Kevin McCarthy. You should get to know him. We, I know we want him to. We want him to come on because we have the other two young guns, uh, Paul Ryan, and uh, Eric, Eric Canner, on, on quite a bit. Let's see. Where do we start? Um, one of the things pointed out a lot of places, Congressman, is that some of the the real social conservatives in the party were disappointed that you guys didn't go further that, you know, didn't, didn't put as much in there. And, and I, I think that might be an appeal to, to not lose some of the independence, no? Well, I think there's a real effort to try and take on things that the American public is speaking out about right now. In other words, you don't have to be a social liberal necessarily not to understand that, that this is a nation in great peril, particularly from a financial point of view. So we took on five major themes and said that we need, these are things that we can do today that if the Speaker of the House convened, you can put these things out by and large and begin to move roll calls right now. And we've said, look, the first thing is we've got to get the economy and, and have a jobs plan that will get us back on track. And we say we need to end the job killing, killing tax hikes that are being proposed. We need to repeal this 1099 requirement. We need to move forward and rein in the federal government and the rulemaking process so that if there is a proposed rule that's going to have more than a $100 million impact on the economy, it should be voted on by elected representatives in the House and the Senate, and it ought not be foisted on the economy by, by bureaucrats. Then there's a spending section that says, let's get this back on a trajectory that makes sense back to pre-2008 levels and repeal TARP and get fans Annie and Freddie back under control. There's a national security section. There's a section that says we need to take on and actually reform the way Congress does business, where the public says, hey, these folks aren't reading these bills, and they're, they're jamming this through in too much time, or in not enough time. We say there's going to be a new 72-hour rule, and the Speaker can do these things today. So I think on balance, the feedback that, that I'm getting initially, at least, and from my constituency in the west and northwest suburbs of Chicago, as I've talked about these themes over the past several months, because this has been a long time in the making, I think this is right where the country wants us to move forward and to move off of this dif dysfunctional path that they see in Washington. Yeah, you're, you've got to walk a fine line in some of the, some of the provisions. Uh, you, you want to extend the tax cuts, but you're going to attack the deficit. So those are, those are sort of the opposite uh, um, moves. One is self-defeating to the other, right? No, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think, look, if you extend the tax cuts, I represent a district that is just chock full of first and second generation companies. And these are companies that by and large, when, when the wheels came off the cart in September of 08, they got their spending under control and they began to understand quickly what the marketplace was looking like. So they, they did that in such a way, now they're uncertain about what's going on in the, in the future. And when the President of the United States tell these Subchapter S companies that they're rich when they're earning 250 and above. It's just incongruous with their real experience. Mm -hmm. So if you cut those taxes, experience shows. Or I'm not even talking about cutting the taxes. I'm talking about making them permanent and not raising the taxes. Experience shows that actually government revenues go up. So these are very much consistent themes moving forward. Congressman, um, the spending is is one thing that w w that I think has is added to the. The voter anger that, that we're seeing, I, I mean, I, I looked at, at New York, the, the shocker in the Times today is Paladino is only six points behind uh, Cuomo. But So the spending is one thing that people want to stop, but if you look back on the, the time when voters really seemed to, to, to uh, go off the rails, I think it was during the passage of health care. I don't know if you'd agree with that or not. I and would. It's, and it's still 60 percent. Uh, actually, that's an unbelievable number that would say yes, repeal it. 60 percent and, and less than 40 on the, on, on the approval. What you guys have to do, though, is, is, is counter the charge that will go back to business as usual, where you don't cover pre-existing conditions, because that's what the president is going to harp on. He's going to say, you know, he's not going to look at all the other parts of the bill. He's just going to say, if you have a sick child that used to be turned down, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. Republicans want to go back to where the insurance companies can, can turn down sick people that have pre-existing conditions. So you can't just repeal it. 
I agree with you. Our plan is, it says, repeal it and replace it. With what? And there's, here's what you do. Uh, there was a very thoughtful alternative that was authored by Dave Camp of Michigan, the ranking Republican on the Ways and Means Committee, that would have actually brought costs down, according to CBO, not, not expending uh, or bringing costs up like the president's plan did. You bring costs down, you increase coverage. Then what you do is you focus in on high-risk pools and actually fund them as it relates to pre-existing conditions. I agree with you that the country has no desire to go back, but what they don't want to hear anymore is they don't want to hear arguments coming out of the White House that say, well, we told you the cost curve was going to come down, but wow, we're, we're not really suggesting that anymore. So I think the overwhelming majority of the public, the 60 percent figure that you cited is the one that I hear, says dump this thing like a hot rock. It's a complete loser. And instead, pick up and move forward on where the public actually wants to focus in on. And that's two primary themes, reducing costs and dealing with pre-existing conditions. Things so you guys aren't going to have the 60 votes. Yeah, and, it, and it, you, you wouldn't have the, the votes till, you know, till probably the 2012 election, right, to override a... Yeah, a, but think about, think about what that argument suggests. If you don't have the votes now, you mean that you don't get the votes later? Right now, there's 32 House Democrats going back on the tax issue that are saying these tax cuts need to be made permanent. On health care, there's not a Democrat in the country that that is running that they voted in favor of the health care bill. So the Democrats are looking at the same political landscape and what we're seeing is, look, break with your leadership, break with the speaker, come out and let's do the right thing and we Nancy can do Pelosi's this deal right now. I think, I think Nancy I think Pelosi is probably <laughs> running on the fact that she helped push health care through. There's not any television ads that she are paid media that Democratic, that Democratic candidates are running that are uh, pro health care, not one. Yeah, and she doesn't really, she kind of just needs to, to wait. And, so she doesn't even need to run. I think Francisco. she's waited a little bit too long, and I think oh. it's time for her to wait in a different waiting room. Uh, yeah, um, we will, at this point, you think it's going to be uh, what type of margin in, in the House? Are you, you're not, I Look, guess I'm you're, not you're afraid the... of complacency to say that it's going to be a, a 10 drag a number out of me. I do think, though, that there is a level of civic responsibility that, that people are waking up and they're saying, look, I, I had one friend, he said, look, Peter, I used to be able to afford not to care who's in Congress. Now I can't afford it. I care who's in Congress it, it, and I'm going to be active. It, it comes, is, is it possible since the, the health care goes into effect, I think, today, some of the provisions that, that some of the, you know, I, I wouldn't call them bribes, but, uh, you know, the incentives, the $250 that seniors are going to get, uh, that, that this starts, uh, you know, that the sentiment starts changing. People start saying, hey, I kind of like getting this check, and, and, and maybe this isn't so bad. Are I you, doubt you? it. I think that this is largely cooked in the cake right now. I think the public has made up his mind. I think the public has said, you've, you've told us what you were going to do on the stimulus and underperformed. You told us you were going to go through the federal budget line by line, and instead you tripled the debt. And you told us the costs were going to come down on health care, and they haven't. I'm ready to hear a different set of solutions, and that's what we're offering later on today, but you guys are hearing it first. Okay, very good. So last time was a contract. Uh, this time it's a... Pledge to America. Pledge. Very good. All right, we'll see what happens. Uh, we don't have that long to wait. How many days, do you know? The clock is ticking. <laughs> All right, Congressman, thank you. And tell